So welcome everyone to this new webinar. Today we're going to discuss very specifically how should we as demand planner, as sales people, as supply chain people review and enrich forecasts, which is I think a main task for many people in supply chain. So let me introduce myself in a minute. I'm Nicola Vanderput. I really just like to introduce myself as someone who's generally passionate about inventory planning and demand forecasting. Over the last years, I published three books. The first one being Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting. It's um, kind of a technical book that's going to teach you from scratch, really from, from, from zero, how to make your own forecast using statistical method and machine learning using Python. Again, this really starts from zero. So if you don't know Python and you want to learn, you know nothing about machine learning, you want to learn, that might be the first step, the first step towards this. Then I moved on to working on more quantitative inventory model with my second book where I, I do various simulation and models step by step, trying out more and more complicated inventory model and see the impact on, on fill rate and service level. And finally, my third book, Demand Forecasting Best Practices, that's more book for supply chain managers and supply chain leaders who want to, to manage and to improve the demand planning process. It is not a technical book. Well, we discuss KPIs, of course, but it's not a technical book like how to make the forecast yourself. It's more how to improve your process. I started to include this quote and this line in most of my presentation, saying that when 50% of the time, planners tend to worsen forecast accuracy when they do a review. It means that when, when a demand planner receives a forecast from a software, uh, for, from a forecast engine, from a software, from, from Excel, from anything, 50% of the times they basically fail to improve this forecast. The main question being, okay, that's that's quite of an impressive number, but how can we do better? How can we, as demand planner, as supply chain professional, improve this percentage beyond 50%? And how can we make ourselves more likely to do that? Now, this sentence, I didn't came to this conclusion myself. It's not based on my own experience, not at all. And as you can see on this slide, it's written academic say. And today I'm extremely uh, glad to have with us Robert Fildes, which actually is the one of the academic who came up with this kind of conclusion during his research. So um, Robert will be able, of course, to give a better explanation of his work, but he has been working for nearly 20 years on this field of supply chain forecasting on how and why people tend to change forecasts and when is it likely that people add value. And that's the exact subject of today's webinar. I am myself a reader of uh, Robert research, I highlighted here on this slide two articles that I read actually multiple times and that I advise you to read if you want to understand in which in which cases people tend to add value. This being said, I would like to leave the floor to Robert so he can share with you his research and then I will take over to discuss best uh, practices with you. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh... As, as you gather, 20 years is uh, not sufficiently long to solve the problem. I've been working with Paul Goodwin and most recently with Shari and Anna on elements of this quite complicated uh, topic. I fell into it by accident. I'm a statistician by background and uh, essentially I was studying forecasting systems and forecasting support systems, the statistics of it, because there's been many statistical innovations over the last 50 years. Why aren't those improvements carried out in practice? Um, and in going into companies, and we were very fortunate round about 2002 to get access, really good access to four or five companies, uh, we started to concentrate on the forecasting process and look at all elements of it. So you've got, on the one hand, the demand planner in the center of activities, getting information from marketing, from sales, from finance and so on, um, a database, uh, some software associated with the database. And this has become an increasingly exciting area uh, with the advent of machine learning and AI. So it, what was he, in 2002, basic statistical methods, exponential smoothing was the core method used, now has all these new enhancements. Do these new enhancements uh, help? Do they remove the, the role of the demand planner? So what was that role? Well, it was to take the statistical uh, 
uh, forecast to take the information that uh, was available uh, to them through marketing, sales, promotional information in the article that uh, has been referenced was a key element of it. And actually to select the, the model or the method, uh, incorporate the information to produce a final forecast. So that was that's the process that we identify. And the question that Nicholas has already posed is how can we make that process uh, more effective? In a sense, we've already had a punchline from the early research, only about 50 percent of the interventions and interventions are expensive. They're not, they're not, not no sense. They're a free lunch. Only about 50 percent of those interventions actually uh, lead to added value. So what do we mean by added value? Well, um, grayed out on this slide is uh, 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 on the, the next slide, in fact, uh, some definitions of added value. But key findings early on, which have been um, confirmed by more recent uh, uh, evidence we've collected, most for uh, organizations judgmentally adjust, whether it's in retail, which is perhaps surprising, but it, it, it very much in the manufacturing and the services. And of course, adjustments take place elsewhere. They take place in weather forecasting. They take place in macroeconomic forecasting. But most of these interventions fail to add value. Um, so effectively, um, the question we have most recently examined by putting all this evidence together is uh, what do we know? Well, 70 to 90 percent, not with retailing, of course, ad <coughs> adjust. Um, it's time consuming, it's complex. It adds, uh, uh, it, it uh, in a sense, interferes with the automatic processing of the information. And the evidence has been very mixed on the effectiveness. So why do we, uh, what do we know about what makes these adjustments effective? Well, actually relatively little. We've carried out also some experiments, I say we, I, I mean a, a broader group than just myself and my, uh, my colleagues, of experiments trying to understand. And it turns out that people misinterpret the historical information. There's a lot of discussion, and I'm sure, Nicholas, in your most recent book, you discussed the SNOP process. It's a complicated, again, an expensive, time consuming process. But the whole aim of that, not that this, the only aim, is to actually generate valuable information about the future as to what's going to affect demand. But actually, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, work very effectively. So what, am I, what do I actually mean by forecast value added? Well, um, effectively, we're going to look at the error and uh, one way or another, average the error. We're going to be interested in the absolute value, the relative absolute value. So think about a, a final forecast, the, an adjusted set of forecasts on the one hand and the basic statistical forecast, looking at ratios. I mean, there are lots of ways of doing it. As I said, it's a controversial subject. There's also a much neglected component of bias, where we don't look at the absolute value except in the, in the final stages of the process, because bias is particularly damaging to the, um, the uh, companies and the inventory process. So that's how we measure it. Um, we've had the old evidence. What's the new evidence? Well, we put together uh, 10 companies, 20 business units, uh, and with aims to try and summarize uh, this uh, and reconcile this early work um, to identify when demand forecasts adjust. What makes the decision to adjust? There's a bit of evidence from uh, other people working in the area. For example, fairly obviously, adjustments will take place mo more often with uh, uh, products which have a short life cycle. The circumstances where value added and bias is improved. Um, can we modify the SNO process? 
are the, is the software components. We do know, and this has been confirmed now with the most recent evidence, that negative adjustments where people get negative information are much more valuable. And this is a bit counterintuitive in a way, isn't it? Much more valuable, uh, much less dangerous than positive adjustments. People make positive adjustments. Hey, we've got the latest promotion happening. How exciting this latest. It can't fail. And people over adjust. Uh, and of course, the final question we wanted to address and <clears throat> is that uh, the, the core question, in a sense, being faced by this seminar, how could we make it all work better? So what determines the adjustment? Well, what should, let me ask you a question. Obviously, it's a rhetorical question of the, the, of the circumstances. But what should people uh, encourage people to adjust? Well, the answer is basically the future. Because the people in the SNOP process, the people in the retail planning division, actually know something about what's going to happen. Uh, they may have a weather forecast that's not part of the model, but they will know promotion plans, perhaps new products, competitors. So the future is what should make people adjust. But is that what makes people adjust? No, it's not. What they previously did, the previous direction of the adjustment, if we adjusted upwards in the last period, we'll adjust upwards this period. Current systems forecasts. Now, that shouldn't matter at all. Errors? Well, again, not really. So a whole set of features have encouraged people to adjust. But what's crucial or should be crucial is the unobserved ob <coughs> information about the future. Now, it's only, only unobserved by me as a researcher. It shouldn't be unobserved in the SNOP process. Is everything OK, technically? Yes, everything is OK. Someone couldn't see the slide, but I see them, so it looks like it's working perfect. OK, so the key question, uh, does adjustment add value? Well, there's a quite a bit of detail in the slide, uh, so I'm not going to go uh, into it at all. And uh, it will be available if you want to look at it either in the working papers and so on. Um, but the key uh, line is the bottom line. Overall, the figures come out. Well, if it's a negative adjustment, yes, it's pretty good. If it's a positive adjustment, it's pretty bad. And particularly bias uh, is not much improved. So uh, there are more positive adjustments than negative adjustments. So overall, one of the impacts of that is that adjustments are often having a negative uh, consequence. Uh, bias is usually improved by adjustments. So that's that's in a sense is a bit of new good news. Now you might have said, uh, well, of course we knew that. Well, actually, the early evidence didn't suggest that was true. So overall, forecast value added in bias and in terms of uh, error is improved, but it's not by much. A related question, and perhaps a, a even more counterintuitive, is: Are uh, can we forecast some skews better than others? Now, your guess would be yes. That surely the answer should be yes to that. But actually, no. It's about fifty percent. It's almost a magic number. That said, in our twenty business units, some of the business units and some of the companies did actually perform substantially better than others. And that really raises an interesting question. So can some SKUs be forecast or some situations be forecast through adjustments? Can they add, add more value? Well, no, it's still, as I said, just about 50 percent. And that really, to me, is very counterintuitive. You've got demand planners. Some of the audience probably have responsibility for particular SKUs and they would 
sure they would say, well, we really know more about that than the other. So there should be a better uh, forecast characteristic. So maybe perishable SKUs, uh, maybe established SKUs, maybe uh, in the X, Y, Z, ABC categorization, maybe the important SKUs, but no, there's no real evidence for that at all. So we're still um, ignorant, really. So where does things go wrong? This uh, tree uh, tries to take us through. Well, here's the adjust up uh, branch of the tree, adjust down. Uh, we can be optimistic. So we can overinflate our forecasts. These are forecasts which are higher than what actually occurred. Um, Hopefully they're in the right direction, but they could be in the wrong direction. That would be really bad news. So the red lines are the ones which are, have bad outcomes to it. And finally, it could be in the right direction, but we might, might be go right over the top, be excessive. So where do things go wrong here? Well, with excessive uh, uh, adjustments in the wrong direction. But, <coughs> well, Maybe that's obvious. I think, Nicholas, you actually said, well, we sort of know that. Well, yeah, yes, but we know it when we think about it. You've got the categorization. But what encourages wrong direction skews? About 35 percent of adjustments are actually in the wrong direction. I think that's an extraordinary figure. So we're really not getting some of those, those those branches are doing us a lot of damage. Why are you in one of those branches? <coughs> Briefly, just a bit about adjustment size. Well, you'd like to think large adjustments showed more, uh, more value. Well, not really. And particularly bad are adjustments which set the forecast to zero. Uh, and I think that's because they're getting confused with inventory decisions. They're not true forecasts. So something's going wrong there. If you ask, and perhaps it's a question to your audience, I don't know whether you put it in your, your questionnaire, Nicholas, but you know what are the motivating factors when you're as a demand planner? Uh, we did the survey back for the original research around about uh, 2006, uh, published a little, little later. And basically the primary aim was accuracy. It wasn't to remove bias, which would bias and accuracy are not simply related. But so a question then, I don't know, you perhaps comment in a moment about that, that question. Um, but that certainly is a key issue that actually um, the size of the adjustment is not a measure, as we thought, we speculated, a measure of what people know. So I'm focusing and we're focusing in our research and in the adjustment process, uh, in the SNOP process as a particular example, uh, but uh, that um, to see whether uh, as you add information, uh, you actually get uh, better forecasts. Well, we, we're aiming for some efficiency, efficiency, removal of bias. Uh, one interesting thing and one potentially important route is the adjustments are predictable. That is to say, we can uh, take out some of the misweighted information, such as the, the, the last systems forecast. Uh, it depends on the information. And in, in, in uh, experimental evidence, information is always misweighted. Um, so if we improve the information, we'll get uh, better forecast accuracy. So what, what have we learned so far? What we haven't learned is how really to do it. Uh, uh, what are the characteristics? Well, previous adjustments, all these things, the, the, the size of the adjustment, the direction, we need to remove these effects from the process. They're not, of course, in the statistical forecast, but they're in the process by which people add value. So we need to identify the skew level characteristics and the processes that deliver forecast value added. Um, that brings 
to the conclu my conclusion that effectively we still, despite me putting together with Paul Goodwin all this evidence, and we're talking about 147,000 observations here, uh, and there's other, other studies going on at the same time, we really don't know the circumstances in which we can add forecast value. And this issue has become more and more acute because with the advent of machine learning, and there may be people in the audience who would claim that machine learning is going to solve all the skills. But there are all sorts of problems. First, if people don't trust the forecast, so, uh, they'll obviously ignore it. Second, there'll be a, a question of overcounting. Have they weighted the weather forecast correctly into it? Do they understand the 10 different types of promotion that our company has? This sort of thing. So actually, uh, machine learning is almost, I, I think, and again, it's a discussion point, uh, is making this issue more important, not less important. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roman. So I'll take over the presentation and we're going to discuss Q&A at the end. I will do everything I can to finish in less than 20 minutes. So we have a bit of time for a discussion. Now, instead of showing you more slides, actually, I would like to take a minute to do some interaction with you. So if you don't mind, you can scan the digicode here on the left side on my computer, or you can go to wooclab.com and type the event code how to forecast. It's for free. I don't think you even really need to register. So it will not spam you or anything. And that's a perfect way to interact with you. So if you can take a minute to scan this or directly to go on the website, I'm going to ask you two questions because I would like to discuss with you now what are really the best practices of what should day by day demand planners do? Like how should they review or not review these forecasts? Let, let's try to make it as practical as possible. So here's my first question, and I have here a lot of tasks. What are for you the priorities of a demand planner. So I, I listed some of the tasks that I think a demand planner could do. I, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad idea. I just like that where some demand planner do that. And I would like you to rate to rate these from zero to five, zero being, well, that's really not important at all. Five being, okay, that's really the first thing they should do ever because this is so important. So let's let's take the time to discuss that. And I think this presentation would be a great opportunity to rediscuss and redefine what should really a demand planner be doing. And I think that the role of what they should do might change with the advent of not just machine learning, but let's say forecast, automated forecast engine. And as we use more and more automated forecast engine, um, a demand planner might spend more time doing some tasks rather than other uh, things. I know it takes a bit of time to reply to these 13 questions, but take your time and let's see um, what happens and what you find is um, very important and not important at all. Now, this is interesting because I. I'll try in, in the next few minutes in slide to discuss most of these points, not all of them, but most, or at least give you an opinion on how I see this uh, evolving in the future. Um, but for me, for sure, for example, point number um, two and five shouldn't be a priority at all. And I will uh, detail that in, in the following slides. So let's take just another minute to see what's the most important for you. I really appreciate that for most of you, you say ensuring good master data quality. This is so important in every single forecasting project I do. We start with this. It's not sexy. It, it takes quite some time to do that, but this is so important. If you don't have good master data, especially regarding life cycle, it's extremely difficult to do a good forecast. So any time spent on improving master data quality, that's for sure an improvement for the end-to-end -end, uh, process. OK, let's just review this second. So making the forecast baseline yourself, you say this is the less important activity. Use the, the sales team forecast as a baseline. You also say this is not so important. Review supply inventory, it's quite low. In between, discuss with supplier, it's quite low. I would also agree with this. Very interesting. Let me move on to my 
presentation and let's discuss these uh, best practices together. Um, so for me, the, the way I see the world and, and the game of forecasting, it's basically the, the way I would I would really define it for a company, it's two main things. You have to realize two main things. The first thing is that forecasting, it's an information game. The, the more information you have at your disposal about the future, the better your forecast is going to be. And it could be any kind of info from promotion, um, historical shortage, seasonality, uh, price, weather, sellout, inventory data of your client, these kind of things. The more you have, the better your forecast is going to be. Um, another part of information that is so important is to make sure that you forecast unconstrained demand and not constrained sales. Um, I'm not going to discuss this in detail today because I want to focus on the role of demand planners, but if for you unconstrained demand and constrained sales, it's a bit of confusing, um, I would advise them to watch the, the previous webinars and some of my writings to really get the difference between the two because that is so critical. So first step, demand forecasting, it's all about information, data, insights, and so on. Now that we have this information, this insight, we need to have a forecast engine that is basically able to use it. And this is where machine learning is so helpful. So now let's imagine a case where you have a supply chain with you know, you know the inventory from your client, you have sellout, you have maybe pre-orders, you have promotion, uh, the, the weather impacts you, I mean, so much. If you feed all this info to a statistical tool, again, I'm not saying it's absolutely impossible to do it, but it's gonna be massively, massively difficult for a statistical engine to make any sense out of all these business driver. Whereas on the other side, if you use machine learning, machine learning is gonna have a great time, it's gonna be much easier to use all of this information to generate a forecast baseline that will be so strong thanks to all this information. So to just put this in, in, in a sentence too, if you want to get a really great baseline for demand forecasting, you need to play this as an information game. So finding more info, more info, more insights and use machine learning to generate this baseline automatically for you. And I really like this term bulletproof automated forecast engine. You want something to use this info and to do it very easily for you. When this is done, we should ask ourselves a question, okay, what should demand planners do now? The first thing they should do is to play this information game. They need to collect insights about your client, about the market, about the trends, about what consumer is thinking. They should um, call your client to ask how is they doing, if they plan on doing a big order, they should discuss with marketing, they should discuss with uh, advertisement people and so on. They should get more information. Again, it's an information game. The more information you have, the better you're going to be at forecasting demand. Once you have this, you need to move on to data cleaning, meaning that you need to ensure that all the input data that's going to your model, um, I'm talking, for example, about master data, product life cycle, dimension section, uh, promotion that are planned in the future and so on, everything is as clean as possible. Again, Maybe the time you're gonna spend on data cleaning will not be seen on a forecast value added dashboard. And yet every single hour you spend cleaning the data, reviewing the data, making sure master data is correct. It's gonna be basically just bonus for your forecasting quality overall. So we collect information and we make sure that this information is um, properly uh, cleaned into the tool. And then you can move on to, okay, we can enrich forecast now. Now, to enrich a forecast as a demand planner, you should think always, do I know something that my forecast engine is not aware of? So let's imagine a case where you have a, bit, uh, a promotion driven business, but your forecast engine is aware of promotion and you took the time to include promotion in the model and to clean promotion, everything is good. So if you are now aware of some promotion, you should not change the forecast because the model is aware of it. And it's kind of unlikely you can beat the model just by looking at the time series of historical promotion, okay? So on, let's imagine another situation where it's the same business, but your forecast engine is not so good. And this forecast engine cannot cope with promotion. So promotion are not part of the forecast engine. Well, then for sure, it's a good time for you to edit the forecast because you need to take this new promotion into account because your engine will not do it for you. Now, let's imagine the case where you say, well, now we have a forecast engine that includes, I don't know, prices and promotion, but me as a planner, I'm just better than the tool at forecasting trends, seasonality, promotion, and prices. Well, 
if you can beat your model just by looking as a human at the time series, I think it's time that we review and improve the model. I think it simply means that your model is not up to the task and you should change and improve your forecast engine. Um, again, human are not computer, and if we can beat computers at computing things, it really means that the computer is doing a really poor job and we should do it uh, differently and we should improve this uh, computer. Now, this is what I think demand planners should do. Now, there is a second question, and I think that um, there is some debate there. What demand planner should not do? And the first one is cleaning outliers. And I know some of you, many of you said, well, cleaning outliers is kind of important. Well, I think cleaning outlier will become something of the past. So for me, all data cleaning, and it should really be done at the transaction level, should be automated. So either a transaction you made with your client is correct or it's not correct. So either it's an error or it's a real order from your client. And if it's a real order from your client, it's extremely, extremely likely it should be taken into account by your model. Um, I made a webinar two months ago only on um, outlier detection. I will put the link in uh, this slide deck so you will have it and you'll be able to watch it again. So I'm not going to spend so much time on outlier detection. But I think that outlier detection should be left to machines. It should be dramatically exceptional for a human to have to change a, a value by hand. On every single forecasting project we do, we never touch by hand any single value. The only thing we do is at time realize that on specific occasion, the whole data is wrong and we remove one week, one month, one day from the data set, but never like one specific case. We automatic, we, we do that by automation, by flagging wrong transaction. Again, allowing people to change historical values. Um, for me, it's basically data hacking and it allows demand prior to spend their time hacking the system, changing value that's going to change KPIs, that's going to change how the forecast engine is going to work. I think it's a bad practice to allow people to change data. Second thing, I don't think demand planners should tweak, should update the model, should change the parameters of the model, should manually select the model, anything like that. I think it's a bad practice. Again, if you can beat your forecast engine manually just because you think that another model might be better, because you think the trend should be different, or you think seasonality should be different, it means that the forecast engine is not good and it means you need to change it. The, the, the main sentence for me, the main point for me here is human and not machine. If we beat machine at computing things, it means the machine is not doing a good job and we should just improve it. Now, the other thing I would argue that demand planner should not worry about and should not do is take into account supply. So for me, we should always forecast unconstrained demand, assuming infinite supply. And if you want to forecast constrained sales, which makes total sense, I'm not opposed to that at all, this should be computed mechanically, automatically by looking at the current inventory and supply position and the current inventory policy. So to make an extremely simple example, if you say, well, my current unconstrained forecast for this product today is 100 units, but it happens that I only have 10 units in stock. Well, your unconstrained forecast is 100 units, but your constrained sales forecast would only be 10 units because you only have an inventory of 10 units, okay? But demand planners shouldn't do that themselves. Again, you should have a planning engine, a supply planning engine that will automatically load the demand forecast, the supply decision, the inventory decision, and so on to basically create for you a sales forecast or a revenue forecast for the future, and you should do that automatically. Again, I don't think we should use the human brain at doing mechanical computation when basically a tool can do it for you. So in short, a demand planner is not a statistical model, it's not a mechanical model, and all these kind of tasks should be done by automated uh, tools. Again, demand forecasting is not supply planning, so these two should be kept separate. Now, I have another question for you and a way to interact before we discuss some question. I'm going to go back to WooClap asking you another question. So now let's really imagine that we are, you are reviewing a portfolio of products and you have maybe a hundred product, a thousand product, millions of products, and you need to know, okay, which one should I review first? And that's the next question I have for you. So in front of a portfolio of product, you are a demand planner, you have a bit of, maybe you have a day, maybe you have an hour to review this. With which product should you start? So please again, vote from zero to five, five meaning, okay, this is exactly what I'm gonna do first. 
and zero meaning, okay, these guys, really, if I have enough time, I'm going to look at it, but it's not the top of my priority right now. So I see no one likes C movers. This is interesting. Let's just wait another minute. So I see new product is like your top one so far. And the worst case is C mover and stable product. This is interesting. Because if you think also there is kind of a, a conflict between we don't want to touch stable product, but we want to touch A movers, which usually are the same. And you say, well, we want to look at intermittent erratic product, but not at C movers, which again are usually the same product. Okay, let me go back to my slide. You will see that it's nearly a trick question on my side. So I would say when you have to decide which product to review next, I would really advise against using ABC. And I'm even thinking to do a webinar entirely dedicated to when to use and when not to use ABC. And in most cases, I'm totally against ABC. So I would not use this basic ABC as I show it on the screen here. If you're using that currently, um, I think you should. Um, uh, you should change that. So in this basic ABC, importance is based on historical volume and forecastability is based on variability. You call it the way you, you, you want on the coefficient of variation COV. I will not get go into the stats, but basically that's just a way to express how much variation of demand you had in the demand average. Now, this is bad for two reasons. First, look, assessing the importance of product based on historical volumes is not likely to work because it's not weighted by value, but just by units, but also because this is backward looking. So if you have some trends, some seasonality, it will never properly take it into account. So it's really a bad idea. Also, measuring forecast ability as COV, it's a bad idea because there is a poor correlation between COV and the ability of a forecast engine to do a forecast. So you could have a, a product with high or low COV, but with high or low forecast ability. So using historical volume and using COV, it's a bad idea. That's something that I also detail on my blog and in my book. Instead, you can improve this ABC. You can measure importance based on value-weighted future forecasts. That's going to be much stronger than what we looked at before, so historical volumes. But also, you can compute forecast ability simply by looking at historical forecast error. And that would allow you to look at products that are big in terms of volume and value and expected value and quite high in terms of forecast error. So that would allow us to flag really A movers that are kind of erratic. But here, I'm saying more, don't do this basic ABC, like just don't do that. I'm saying you could do the improved version. It makes sense. In many cases, it could make sense, but there is something better you can do. And it's just not to focus on product, but to focus on insight. So I would say we have to shift from a product driven review mindset where I'm like, okay, what's the most important product? I'm going to start there and to move to a, a focus and, and a mindset of what do I know that my model is not aware of? And I'm going to focus on that. So instead of thinking, okay, what about a movers or intermittent product or these kind of things? No, it's just fine. Okay. Today I'm going to call my main clients and I'm going to get information from these clients. And then I'm going to directly go and edit the product that my client talked about because I get new insight from my clients. Um, maybe I'm going to go discussing with marketing people to see if they plan on doing some advertisement because I know my model is not aware of advertisement and I'm going to change the, the forecast for just these products. So again, we shift from I'm going to review products to I'm going to get insights and change products which are directly impacted by these insights. And this is my last advice for you um, today, and I'm just right on time. I will send you the slide anyway, and I included um, some links to some other discussion on forecast value added. Robert mentioned that as well. Very important, outline detections. There is another webinar just on that. So if you want more info on why I don't advise to do it manually, that would be where you would find it. Again, remember, if you can beat your forecast engine, just by looking at time series visually, it really means that you need to improve your forecast engine and it's not up to the task. This being said, I think we have time for maybe let's say two or three question maximum. Um, Robert, maybe 
maybe you had more time than I did to read the comments. Maybe you have one question you would like to answer. I see people <laughs> had an amazing uh, conversation the, the, in the, the chat. Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, high variety of uh, uh, of commentary, really. And so I, I'm going to pass on that for a moment anyway. OK, just give me a sec. I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to read that and, and come back to a uh, question. I mean, the forecast value added discussion that you provoked, uh, Nicholas, is, is spot on, of course, about which you concentrate on. And it certainly isn't just a products, but essentially there's also a related question is where do you get forecast value added, which actually may be in C products, uh, curiously enough. Um, and uh, your stress on getting information into the process I, I wholly agree with and that that's the way our evidence points i mean the, i said there are two companies who actually uh, managed to get on top of, would seem it may be of course that they had such a bad forecast engine that they couldn't do anything other than add value to it so there, there is a, a twist to that it depends yeah, so course, if we've got a good course. forecast uh, engine then it's going to be a lot harder to add value. So that issue, that dilemma. Um, yeah. But for most companies that I've experienced, and I'm interested in your comments, the 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 quality of the forecast engine, together with the staff, the staff in general, and perhaps there are many people here, don't have the time, the resources to actually uh, tune their forecast engine. So consultants come in, possibly like you, and they say, here's the forecast engine, but actually it really needs to be fine-tuned and that to the organization and to their database. And that's difficult and it requires expertise that often isn't in the company. I this is very interesting. I was thinking that maybe a future field of research, and I know that in the audience today we have a lot of academics as well, and maybe PhD students or people who find to do uh, thinking about PhD would be to to do the same kind of analysis as you did, but asking people like an extra question: Why did you do this change? Because you felt like it? Because it looked like it? Because someone told you to do it? Because you wanted to please your manager, or because you had pressure to increase the forecast this month? Or did you get some information from someone about it? Now, I quickly saw a few questions I would like to answer very quickly. The first question someone asked was, can machine learning help me to know which product I should review? Well, some um, academics did some research on that with some uh, interesting results. I did an experiment with that myself. Now, doing that might make some sense, but it would require you to first do multiple monthly cycles, or weekly cycles of editing the forecast before we can make a model that really says to your team which items they should review. And these kind of machine learning models that are basically learned from human, um, I, I worked with that years ago on outlier detections, it tend to be unstable because if some human behaves strangely, the machine learning might get some very strange conclusion from that. So I'm afraid that these kind of model, I would pay very close attention every three or six months to ensure that it's kind of stable. Someone else asked, I think, a, an interesting question. How many demon planners do you need to 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 manage a portfolio of fifty thousand products? Um, I've seen clients where you had one planner for one product because this product was so big and was worth so much money. They had one person, one product, and I've seen clients where they have one person for one hundred thousand product because the value of a single product is really low. So for me, it depends on the value of your product and the forecast value added of your team. Again, and we discussed that in in numerous webinar, and I did a webinar just on that. Tracking forecast value added is the most important thing. As long as every planner you bring to the table is adding value to your forecast and making it better, adding new planners might be a great idea. But up to a certain point, and that's the subject we have today, and as Robert explained, in many cases, we struggle to add value. It means that even on very large portfolio, it might not be worth it to have an army of people reviewing it, being planners or salespeople or whoever, because they might struggle to add value. Again, I would move from this product mindset to an insight mindset thinking what kind of insight do we have and based on this insight then we can review the forecast um thank you so much
I, I see another interesting thing from uh, from Philip saying, do we need to exactly understand how the model works to make a change? I don't think so. I think what's very important is not to understand how the model works. It's a bit like if you go to this, you, you have a, an appointment at the hospital and they need to do like a very complicated operation on you. And you say, well, I only want you to use tools and process and do things that I fully understand. If I, if I take a medicine, a pill, I need to understand all the chemical reaction related to that. If you do that, no one can help you, or you first need to study for six to 10 years before you can start to get some uh, medical procedure. It's a bad idea. I don't think as a demand planner, you need to understand machine learning or be a data scientist or be a statistician or have a PhD in math to be able to review forecast. Now let's look at a simple example. If I use a model and I know this model is not aware of the weather and I know that tomorrow is going to be a storm, it's going to be especially sunny or whatever, I can review the forecast. Even if I don't know the math of the tool, I simply know that the tool can or cannot take into account some sort of insight and that's enough for me to deliver value. So I don't think the main planner needs to all have a PhD in math and also Robert, I don't think that the, the science you did prove that people with PhD are better at reviewing forecasts than people without <laughs> any kind of formal education. <laughs> no, so, so, which is the proof that there is no correlation and we don't need people to understand the exact math and code of model. We're going to stop here. Thank you so much, Robert, for being with us today. I love your research. I will include in the slides the, the paper. I really enjoy reading from you. Thank you for your research. We will meet uh, with Robert later in Dijon this year. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. If you have more questions, feel yeah. free to, to send them on LinkedIn or email. Give uh, yeah, Nicholas uh, that uh, the, there's a further discussion at the forecasting symposium on Dijon. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Great evening, depending where you are. And see you Bye. next month for another webinar. Bye.